and we'll we'll talk more about this. But I will, in fact, well, let me just let me just read chapter one, verse one, and then we'll get into the prophecy after that. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Teokoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah of Judah, the days of Jeroboam, son of, of Joash of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So um, this, this this prophecy happened, I think most scholars say 760s, give or take. There was a big earthquake, so we kind of know exactly when this was, this was when that happened. Um, Amos was from Judah, the southern kingdom. But he did most of his prophecies in the northern kingdom of Israel. That's, that's why it says, uh, concerning from concerning Israel, the days of um, of Uzziah, who was from the shepherds of Teokoa. So we know where he is from, and we know where he was prophesying. But what is interesting about Amos, particularly in comparison to someone like, say, Isaiah, is that he was a shepherd. Amos wasn't from the school of prophets. You know, Amos wasn't one that w had royal influence. You know, Isaiah had, was in the king's court. Samuel, earlier on, was, was very, had a lot of authority in the climate of the day. Amos was a shepherd. Now, so what I always find interesting about Amos and his prophecy, Amos was tending his sheep. The Lord laid this word upon him. He went to Israel. He said his peace. And that was it. And I think that's one of the things that is interesting about Amos. And that's interesting for us to consider is who God uses. And so often we think, well, God can only use certain people who have had a certain experience or a certain education or a certain whatever. And that simply is not the case. Amos was a prophet in the Old Testament, which mean this meant the Spirit fell upon him. And it meant he had this Spirit from God to go and prophesy. That was how it worked pre-Pentecost. The Spirit of God fell upon you, and you went and preached the word that the Spirit laid upon your heart. That's the way it worked. Well, we now live in a post-Pentecost world where the Spirit falls upon all of us. Every one of us. Me, you, Everybody, when we said in Joel that the, I'm going to upon your sons and daughters shall pour out my spirit. Everyone has a spirit that's been poured out upon them. All of us. You can't confess Jesus apart from the Holy Spirit. So all of us, all of us have the spirit upon us. And all of us have access to the spirit. Not just, not just the prophets, not just your few folks like Amos, or not just your preachers, or not just your religious leaders, but if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, if you've confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, then you have the Spirit upon you, and you have the Spirit of God at, at work in you and, and work through you. So um, so Amos, I think, is that example of that, of the Spirit of God that is at work. And so today, God can use you. You can be used by God, no matter what. No matter who you are, no matter what your experience is, no matter if you've been in the church for decades, or no matter if you just got saved, the Spirit of God can use you. Don't think that God wants to use somebody else. Don't think that God can't possibly use me. But understand that God wants to use everybody. There's no prerequisites upon being used by God. You don't have to take a certain class to be used by God. Now, listen, if you want to be a preacher, if you want to be something like that, yeah, then you probably need to get some training, of course. We all need to be trained. I'm not even sure my granny graduated high school. And God used her in amazing ways. Some of the wisest folk I met in my entire life hadn't lived, hadn't gone 20 miles outside of where they lived. You know? God can use all of us. So don't think just because you're not so-and-so or such-and-such -such, that God can't use you. God can use anybody. God called Amos from among the shepherds, 
Amos prophesied to the kings and to all of Israel. Then he returned back to his flock. God wants to use you today in your job, in your family, in your community. God wants to use you. Amos is a great example of who God can and will God you who God will use. So let's let's read chapter one, and we'll, we'll probably spend a day or two in chapter one. So I don't want I don't want you to feel like we got to get to all of it today. Pick it up with verse two, and he said, "The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pasture the shepherds wither, the, the top of Carmel dries up. Thus says the Lord." For three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke punishment because they have threatened Gil Gil Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. So I will send a fire on the house of Hazael and I, it shall devour the strongholds of Ben-Hadid. I will break the gate bars of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the valley of Adam. And the one who holds the scepter from ben Beth Eden and from the keep, all the people of Aram shall go to exile in Ker. Says the Lord. Thus says the Lord: For three transgressions of Gaza, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they carried uh, carried into exile the entire communities and handed them over to Eden, Edom. So I will send fire to the wall of Gaza, a fire that shall devour its strongholds. I shall cut off the inhabitants of Ashdod, and the one who shall hold, hold the scepter from a skeleton. I shall turn them against Ekron, and the remnants of the Philistines shall perish. Says the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God: For three transgressions of Tyre, and for four, I will not revoke punishment. Because they delivered the entire communities over to Edom and did not remember the covenant of kinship. So I will send fire onto the wall of Tyre, a fire that shall devour its strongholds. Thus says the Lord, for treats transgressions of Edom, and for four I will not revoke the punishment. Because he pursued his brother with a sword and cast off all pity, all pity and maintained his anger perpetually and, and kept his wrath forever. So I will send a fire on Terman and shall devour the strongholds of Borza. Thus says the Lord, Retreat three transgressions of the Amorite, and for four I will not revoke punishment, because they have ripped open the pregnant woman from Gilead in order to enlarge their territory. So I will kindle fire against the wall of Rahab, of, Ra of, of Rabbah, a fire that shall devour its strongholds, with shouting on the day of battle, and in the storm of the whirlwind. Then their king shall go into exile, he and his officials together. So we see, and we're going to see this going into the next part of chapter two, where he's going to he's going to uh, critique Moab. Um, so. God is pronouncing judgment, um, and, and you see he's pronouncing judgment against Damascus, against Gaza, against Tyre, against Edom, against the Amorites in just chapter 1 for various transgressions and various sins. Um, they, have, they have harmed each other. They have, uh, they have carried people into exile. They have been prideful. That's always Damascus is always, in Lebanon, is always full of, you see pride in the Bible. They're always synonymous for that. They pursued their brother. They cast off all pity. Um, they have ripped open pregnant women to enlarge their territory. They've sought power. Um, and this goes back to one of the words in Joel. We see a lot in Joel. And this is part of the prophets. Prophets show us that God is not absent from history. That the that God is active in history. And that God will bring punishment. God is not blind to human, to human sin. And... I think once again, that's that's an encouragement for me, and I hope for us is that it's not our job to punish the wicked. God's going to take care of it. I love Jesus, the parable of the wheat and the tares. How the wheat and the tares grow up together, and in the day of judgment, the angels will separate the two. And so, um, we see judgment against all of these groups who have worked against God. God sees. God understands. Amos is coming with this message from God saying, I see what you're doing. I see how you brought harm. I see how you've hurt. I see how you worked against God. I see your vengeance and your hatred and your all these things. And I'm going to act against it. And so we see God doing this to the nations today. But don't get too comfortable. Because tomorrow we're going to see God's judgment against his people. But we see now his judgment against the nations. And Amos tells us that God is not God is not blind to these sins, these actions, but he will bring judgment. So today, be faithful. If God's called you, act. If God's called you to do something, do it. Be faithful. And know that God sees. And God is at work. So thanks for being with us. Tomorrow we'll pick up with Amos chapter 2. We'll see you in the morning. Have a great day.